and welcome to Hot Issues. Today we are looking at an issue which is causing a lot of pain and a lot of anxiety, not just in Ghana but throughout the world. Uh, we are talking about Ebola. What is it? What brings it about? How long have we known about it? And what can we do to prevent it? These are some of the issues that we'll be looking at today. We're talking Ebola. Hello and welcome to Hot Issues. Uh, we are discussing Ebola today. We're going to find out its origins, the threat it poses, how we can deal with the threat, and, and so on. What have West African leaders done about it? What has the World Health Organization done about it? We want to understand Ebola today. And we are uh, privileged, indeed privileged, to have with us in the studio Dr. Bedou Sarkodie, head of the Disease Surveillance Unit of the Ghana Health Service. So you're welcome to the studio. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Nice meeting you. What is Ebola? Right, thank you very much. Ebola is one of the severe acute viral hemorrhagic fever conditions and I've mentioned a lot of uh, words that seem technical. I'll take my time to explain them. Uh, we say it's a viral disease that, will be, that means that the causative agent is a virus. But we have um, germs that cause disease. We have viruses, parasites and bacteria. But this one, the causative agent is a virus. And um, you say it's a viral hemorrhagic fever. So as part of its presentation, there is fever and there is bleeding tendencies. These are the key cardinal uh, signs and symptoms of the disease. Um, it's a very severe disease, severe in terms of people that can easily be affected, also severe in terms of the people that get it, the quantum of fatality that come after the people that are affected. And that can lead to massive outbreaks and the people that are affected, a lot of them uh, happen to lose their life as a result of this infection. So Ebola in simple term is a very severe disease, potential for massive outbreaks, potential for massive fatality, and it's caused by a virus, and for that matter, the name acute viral hemorrhagic fever. The signs and symptoms, I've mentioned a few of them, but then it doesn't start just with the bleeding tendencies. Initially, there may be just constitutional symptoms, general symptoms as the fever I mentioned earlier, muscle pain, general intensive weakness, body weakness, and some of them may have painful throats. This will can simulate a lot of other diseases. Even malaria can present the same typhoid fever, and most of the febrile conditions may present as such. For, that will be from about up to four second, four five days. Then after, then the difficult part starts. The multiple organ failure and then the bleeding tendencies start. The person may be bleeding from any of the body orifices or body openings. Coughing out blood, passing bloody stools, vomiting out blood, and even underneath the skin, the person bleeds. So you may see um, those with fair color, some red patches underneath, and then those dark as we are, then we may see dark patches, big patches. Any small prick, profuse bleeding, that is difficult to control. And that is how Ebola present. Some of them may even bleed into the eyes and that you can see that the eyes are very uh, red, brick red and so that is how it is. It can, the, the extent of the severity, the pe if 10 people are infected, are, are, are diseased, up to about nine of them could lo lose their life and uh, that is the worst case scenario but then the fatality can be from 20 to 20 percent to 90 percent um, currently the 
countries that are affected with this outbreak within the West Africa sub-region uh, started from Guinea and a lot of cases of a lot of cases a lot of deaths and even Guinea continued to report fresh cases with a lot of people still dying and then Sierra Leone Liberia these countries are all within the West Africa sub-region I think this is the first time that um, the outbreak has hit us here in the West Africa sub-region. The first outbreak, if you go back into history, the first ever recorded outbreak of Ebola was sometime in 1976 in DR Congo. And indeed, that is how the name started. Around a river in DR Congo, the river Ebola, and that time there was simultaneously um, outbreak at DR Congo and also in Sudan. That was the first time ever. But then subsequently, there have been other outbreaks. Some of them are quite extensive, but not as extensive as we are having this outbreak. Usually, the outbreaks are either limited to urban settle. If it starts in the inspection, it's spreading in the urban area. You usually don't have combined urban and rural outbreaks. And this time, we have the outbreaks in three spread to involve three countries in our sub-region and then um, urban community are affected, the rural community also affected and most outbreaks usually within a month, maximum month and a half to two, we have been successful in containing it but this time it has protracted, lingered around so long and it started late in, it was detected, it did, he de detected and confirmed this outbreak in Guinea late in February this year. And we are now in about middle of, getting to middle of July. Yeah. And we are still lingering and there is no clear indication that the case condition is stopping. We have a way to find out whether the outbreak is coming out. And that you plot and then the chart go this way goes up and then you see the clearly on the descendants descendancy but then the curve is still not has has not even peaked and so obviously from epidemiologic point of view so if we are not more aggressive this outbreak will continue to be with us maybe for the next two three months which is very which will be very unfortunate that is why all on board or you shouldn't see it as problem in Guinea, and that for that matter, Guinea problem. Guinea, uh, Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone. We need to support them as a sub-region. We need to support them as a African region, and the whole it's a global threat. Now people can quickly move from Guinea, wherever, to any part of this world within just less than 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So no one should think that this is a problem in Guinea. For that matter, you should let them fight their fight. But it's a global threat, it's a regional threat, and all of us should come together to support the management of this outbreak and make sure that we contain it. Previous outbreaks usually were in Central Africa and East and Central Africa, yes, and East Africa regions. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time West Africa sub region we have confirmed this outbreak and has happened to be the most extensive. A lot of people coming down, most a lot of countries being affected, and the death toll is very huge. There's been some, quite some controversy about the origins of Ebola. Right. As you indicated, around DR Congo, Congo. 1976 or thereabout. Right. But there, there are other accounts which trace Ebola to Sorry. the bubonic plague in Europe in the 1940s. Right. So, Which is the true account of the origin? The, 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 the documented one where we, which is uh, no, the literature is the DR Congo, Sudan uh, outbreak. Mm -hmm. So the first documented where well, following that outbreak we isolated the virus and came out 
with the clear characteristics of the uh, type of gem that you are dealing with. Mm -hmm. So there are things happen like this. There are a lot of theories. Like people mentioned that HIV, some says from Africa here, and that through genetic mm -hmm. modeling and uh, manipulation, it emerged, and uh, we're using it in some um, sexual groups. But then all these are theories. But then the, the what is documented is and clearly written is what we use in science so but in is, is there any basis for associating ebola with the bubonic plague in europe well that much uh, i don't have much information on that mm. and i i don't I, I i can't um talk much on that because i don't have much information on that okay that, that's very fair uh, that, that, that's very fair but you know um this disease how does it present how does it present itself i mean you say it's a fever yes how different is it from other fevers the fever in ebola is very intense form of fever and high grade fever and um you treat with any antibiotics is not responding because it's not by um, not by any uh, bacteria or microbe that respond to antibiotics. You give antipyrectics or anti fever agents; it's not responding to it. Mm. It's you give other antiviral agents; it's not responding because it's there's not it's not hitting the virus directly. So there's high grade fever. And for getting to about a week or so after the infection, after the disease, onset of the disease, then the bleeding tendencies start. There are a few other disease conditions that present similarly. The initial presentation, a lot of diseases with the fever, muscle pain, body weakness, a lot of diseases present as such. Malaria, so at, at, at so what that's point what would we begin to suspect Ebola? At what point would we then we focus attention on Ebola, Ebola right. rather than any, any other, other condition? Fever. Yeah, right. When the country has not declared outbreak like we are in Ghana now, it will be difficult to take any constitutional symptoms and suspect Ebola. That then here the first time that you suspect, then the bleeding tendencies should be high in the clinical presentation but then countries that have confirmed cases and uh, so if you have been in contact with a case and you start having fever at that time you will not wait till you start bleeding then quickly the index of suspicion is very high and then you start investigating as such if somebody visits guinea and come back and within the incubation period of 21 days you have started, started having fever. You have this travel history. You will not wait till the bleeding tendencies start. You have to think about Ebola. So you combine if a few other factors apart from the symptom, uh, symptomatic presentation. Mm -hmm. And that if you have been in contact with suspected case or confirmed or probable case or... Um, if you can directly be linked to a case, then the index of suspicion is quite high, and that the early onset, any fever, muscle pain at that time, you test for, uh, consider possible suspected Ebola or suspect Ebola, and start investigating as such. Uh, how far is the state of bleeding from death, from mortality? Usually within 24 hours, uh, the, if you start bleeding 24, 48 hours, uh, usually death follows. Unless you are lucky and you happen to have intensive supportive treatment, mm -hmm. that you are bleeding quick, the, 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 the blood output can be very profuse. People just throw out first bouts, maybe uh, more than a liter, not only by 
in and from all the orifices what you can see by the eyes if you are what you are vomiting passing through the stools there can also be internal bleeding that you can also be bleeding into the uh, the, the, the intestinal the, the abdominal space and then also within the chest cavity and so it's difficult even to quantify how much exactly is being lost because some could be internal and some is the external one that you can quantify immediately so the bleeding is profuse so why don't we have a policy which says that anybody who has a fever you know must be suspected anybody who has a fever will be it, a suspected it, it, case it, it, i agree between the, the bleeding and uh, death is only 24 hours it's a short time that's it's, it's too short the difficulty if you suspect it you should take steps to do it's not just suspect ebola and then watch take steps to do a lot confirm. of tests mm -hmm. to confirm it or rule it out mm -hmm. but then looking at our situation where more than th thousands of fever a day how do you get if s s samples from all these cases send all these cases to lab to get the test done and obviously almost all will be negative if the problem is mm -hmm. not prevalent in that mm -hmm. country mm -hmm. and that this can even drain our laboratory resource mm -hmm. so if you are not careful the time that you really have a case in hand you go to the lab no reagent because you cannot sustain continuous testing testing that you have to be at a point in time it has to be targeted and mm -hmm. most focused mm -hmm. and that is the situation it might be good that we do this and if the test had been a simple test there are some of the conditions like malaria you have a rapid diagnostic test i believe in future you can get there rapid diagnostic test quickly we subject to the, 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 the these tests and it's not invasive procedure doesn't require mm -hmm. getting to specialized lab and reference laboratories and then you can get the uh, results credible results quickly. you can get a credible results quickly that would be very good then everybody will be tested but now that those rapid tests haven't emerged yet and we using that the viral culture uh, or uh, pci pulmonary uh, chain reaction which is a molecular test and at a specialized laboratory and that is the reason why you cannot test everybody who has fever for ebola okay. Welcome back to Hot Issues. We are taking a look at Ebola and we are talking to Dr. Bedou Sakwadier, head of the of the disease surveillance you know, department of the Ghana Health Service. I, I indicated that we wanted to find out about the causes of Ebola. How do people get Ebola? From where do people get Ebola? Right. The early onset of the outbreak, in the early outbreak, uh, the beginning of the outbreak, usually we pick the infection from the wildlife. I will explain. There are some animals in the wild, the bats. They are natural hosts of the, of the virus. And that the bats are hosting the virus. They never get ill. They never get sick. So people whose activity take them close to bats, and if the bats in that area are, are infect, infected, then the, those people get the infection, and then they bring the infection home and subsequently express or the subsequent transmission from person to person. So initial outbreak quickly, those people whose activity are with the wild, then they come home and then the subsequent mostly from person to person. And um, so the people that bring the virus home at that time, even before you realize that you are having Ebola outbreak, those people that might have died and so it's the person to person transmission which is now most uh, prevalent and everybody would see. Apart from the bats, there are some animals that uh, also can be infected, but then they also get sick and can die as humans, as we also suffer Ebola. And these animals include um, the primates, the monkeys, the gorilla, the chimpanzees. They can all get Ebola and die 
have similar presentation as we the human beings do so far and uh, other animals like the antelope the porcupine they all can get ebola and die as a result of the of the of the infection and the disease so that's it initially from contact with the wildlife and then from it comes spreads from person to person following the initial infection co uh, contamination with the wild from the wild and then it spreads from person to person so that's how ebola spreads but doc we know this fact that contact with wildlife is is dangerous in this situation right what can we do about it should we stop eating bats should we stop eating monkeys or can we begin testing you know colonies of this this wildlife to find out whether indeed ebola is there right um i know and for sure that some work has gone on and has already been done here in ghana and is still ongoing and that some wildlife experts have tested far they have a way to trap the uh, protecting themselves of course the bats and those here in 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 accra and then also in kumasi these are where people can see a lot of bats um they have some viruses the the the, the Nipa viruses and other viruses but then not clearly they don't they are that they haven't been identified to have the ebola, ebola virus um there are parts of the country somewhere in the brongahafu area i think the boyem area the caves there the bats there are also fruit eating and the test detected the antibody of not the antigen the antigen is a active virus and the antibody is a response mechanism with the presence of the virus in that bat the antibody were detected in a few of them i think that up to about no less than one percent anyway given indication that these were at point in time infected with the ebola virus because if you are not never infected you not build an, an, an antibody re response to the virus so that area the bats there uh, are, are not safe uh, to put it that way and these that are that is in the broad half region the Ebo eboyam area in the bronga half region the caves the caves there those the bats there from that study from the game of wildlife detected those antibodies in them mm -hmm. and um, the next thing is uh following up with your the issue so why don't we stop that's done it but well now we i don't think as a country you are fresh there because the bats there mostly almost all here what you see uh appear to be sterile apart from according to test done so areas where the bats are, are known to be infected then quickly you have to ban the contact with the bats and for that matter hunting the bats but i think ghana you are not reached there yet but should we wait for the infection before we, we, we infect the ban there 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 are there are other sides of manipulating ecology you, you see the ecolo the dynamics in ecology is a bit complex you start that then it may lead to something else so that that policy has to be adequately you know thought through and we don't have to uh, rush into that how long would it take us to think through the policy well <laughs> well that's it's the this the, the risks now with our wildlife it's quite minimal as at now for ghana that's why i'm saying that but then the danger is now after the initial contact even in guinea now the transmission is even person to person mm -hmm. so the focus you shouldn't lose focus and divert our uh, attention to uh, areas where you will not have much, any much benefit the focus now is person to person transmission so how do we deal with that even in areas like um, liberia sierra leone and guinea where 
the outbreak is currently is the focus now the the, the transmission now is person to person mm -hmm. so that should be the the, the prime um, means that if you address that this outbreak will stop now so now it appears that the the the, the spread of the disease is from person to person yes now we also understand that uh, is not a virus which is in the air as as it were yes it's not airborne that's it's correct. not airborne that's correct you know, so from person to person how does it get transmitted do you have to touch the person do you what do you have to do with the person who is infected before you get it right um usually the the, the when a person is infected and especially get diseased that would mean that the infec infection is the virus coming into you and the disease is the manifestation of signs and symptoms. Mm -hmm. So the diseased person, almost all the body fluid is highly contagious material. Highly contagious. Highly contagious. So saliva, so the saliva tears, tears, tears urine. urine, seminal fluid, blood, dangerous, and the other body organs. So apart from the f those body fluids, and then the body tissues. Every, so the person might have vomited and soiled him or herself. The person might have soiled the surface of this table. Some of them may not, you may not even f see with the eyes, but then the, the contamination is there. So if you should touch it, times you think that the hands are intact, that the skin is intact. But then there may be minor abrasions, minor, minor cuts, through which the viruses can enter and then it gets to the bloodstream and then the problem starts. So there's any any splash or contact with surface already infected then you the, then the, that contamination is the problem and that's how the infection starts. Hmm. What about, uh, you know, these days we're trying to become more European than the Europeans. I mean, this habit of giving pecks and kissing and so on. What is your advice on that? So, in, if, if I, in, in outbreak setting, where people clearly, you have outbreak, people have, have an infection, um, peg with exchange of saliva, it's a dangerous um, a task, a dangerous uh, process, and, and uh, it does with the, 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 the a confirmed outbreak. That's not something good to be done. Hmm. But but the question is, should we wait for the outbreak? Well, shouldn't we just be telling people that look, it's, it's fluid, so don't kiss another person. Let's it's, wait for six months without kissing. It's it's complex, a bit complex, and that's how see uh, the situation when you have problem on hand clearly that the setting and the platform is uh, not friendly and dangerous at that time all these things can come up but then uh, the, how should this also um, interrupt the social activities the country and that will mean if you say no kissing including your wife that will mean that and uh, no peg including your wife so if you confirm a first case then initially then you have to step up all the various interventions and the processes to contain it but uh, for now <laughs> for now, otherwise the world, no, uh, the, 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 no it's, it's, it's a big problem. It's a, it's a danger, but then, so it's good that you keep watching. But if you confirm the first case, then all these things that you are saying, then we can activate some of them. But now, uh, you, you start it and you're not achieving results. Human beings are human beings. You get fed up, and. They and everything, will, breaks they, everything breaks down. And the time that you need to implement it or suggest it, people will not take it serious. Now, it is said that Ebola has no cure. That's true. And yet, not all the people who get Ebola die. Why? You see, individual differences, um, uh, let's take a simple scenario. When there's road traffic accident, 
two people in the same bench, same seat, same vehicle moving, same speed, there are some survivors. So people with their mic and um, the resilience of the individual vary. The resilience, um, something can happen if somebody slaps me one or two, I'm off. But we may be a stronger one. We mean can, some people can face AK and there will be survivors. So though it's, it's Ebola is a, a very serious disease that um, can kill a lot of people, the individual make is one. How does the immune mechanism support these people, these people to go through the infection, infective cycle till the body gets rid of it? That is one. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, usually in the early stage of the outbreak, that is where um, the death toll is usually high. The support that we receive from the medical system. Mm -hmm. Though we, you say it's not cure, well, in a way it's correct, but it's not, uh, there's no treatment, it's not correct. Because the supportive treatment can have some impact on the survival of the person or otherwise. If the supportive treatment is very optimal or maximal, you lose, all that you are losing is support you and that all that you require for replenishment or for resuscitation you receive. If so it's basically about blood transfusion. Transfusion. Uh, the, the, IV the, the fluids. Transfusion of more fluids. Uh, so basically, basically that. Mm -hmm. So if you are losing, you are losing too much blood, it, you are transfused. If you are losing too much fluid, you are infused. And then, um, how timely do this start? Because if you start too late. The people don't report early and it starts late. The, the support comes late depending on the, the time the person reported. Mm -hmm. At that time they have having multiple organ damage. If it starts that way the, you are starting at the time that a lot of the organs have already been damaged and probably to the extent that you can not be uh, repaired then it's unfortunate. Then irrespective of whatever we would do at the health setting, then the person we might, 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 might pass on, might, might pass on. So it depends on the individual survival, individual body mechanisms, how resilient the person is. The building body antibody, uh, uh, anti, uh, antibody response to the infection and then the support systems that the person will receive depending on the facility that you you, you, you are. If the very experienced people know what they are about and then giving you maximal or optimal support, then at least there's chance for survival improves. Now, Doc, those who survive Ebola attacks, do they carry any special risk which is distinct from those who've never had it? And for example, if, if there are some diseases. I mean, if you get a viral attack, it then acts as 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 a, as, a, as, a, as a, an inoculation. Okay. Yeah. And what about Ebola? If you get an Ebola attack, do you carry a special risk? The attack. See, the, the for every we have the attack, and then even at after the person has recovered. Um, people that have survived, they, they've been followed up, and up to more than two months, more than 60 days, some of them, the body fluids still have the virus. So if somebody survived the disease, 21 it's days. not... The 21 days is the incubation period, the time of infection to onset of signs and symptoms. Mm -hmm. You can go through the disease uh, cycle, that initial fever, bleeding tendencies, you survive the bleeding and then you may recover the conference that we had here um last week with the inter uh, ministerial international ministerial conference that brought all the ECOWAS um ministers of health mm -hmm. and the development partners together here in accra we ghana uh, did host it um the two people, one lady and one, a gentleman, a gentleman, were made to join. They came from Guinea, and they gave their story 
of surviving Ebola and indeed it was terrible the things that they've gone through after that the social the psychosocial stress the social stress on them was one of them kicked off from the workplace after they have survived and in this one they suggested that even the the, the World Health Organization and the country minister should take it up and then at least either they find another job for it. Now this person has recovered it's more than six months three, two, three months ago anyway but then kicked off from work they were about six in family and only two survivors the whole the entire family were infected. That is why I say the close contacts. So if uh, one person has it, it's likely that the family is yours. That is where you, you have kids they sit on your lap and they playing with you, shake hands. So you share a lot of things, the four minds, mm -hmm. the door handles. So the family, when it comes in the family, it's very big disaster for the entire family. And that's well, what we, we cannot tell those who are predisposed to, the, to the, surviving the, the, uh, the, 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 that one is difficult so that, it has to hit you and then that, that, you that, die, you exactly know. exactly that so with, with time study further studies then the features of the survivors then then they will be documented and people will study into it and then these are the characteristics of individuals that in a way was um, determined the higher or lower chance of survival and indeed people that are having previous immunosuppression by the time that you be hit if you are having problem with immunosuppression that is very bad then mm -hmm. even at that time it will not take long to pass on. So, and uh, people that are not suppressed, uh, HIV, AIDS patients, the people chronic diabetes, people with cancers, the chronic debilitating disease conditions. When they have it already, the immunity is down. So, the fighting it is a problem. It's and, more, uh, difficult. more difficult. Welcome back to Hot Issues, and we are discussing the threat of Ebola, uh, the symptoms, how to handle ourselves, and now we want to focus more attention on measures that the Ghanaian health authorities are introducing in order to deal with this possibility. We are talking to Dr. Bedou Sakodier, who is head of the Disease Surveillance Department of the Ghana Health Service. So what are the measures which we are taking in order to deal with this possible outbreak? Right. Um, the health sector or the agency appeared to be in the lead, but then this should be seen as a national response with all hands on deck. And um, should you shouldn't say that it's the health team that should handle it as you talk you understand me as you proceed and that um, as, as as we as soon as we had the received the alert in early March we had a national emergency preparedness and response plan and this plan immediately has to be updated because to, we, for viral hemorrhagic fevers we, for some time, I think the last, the first one we picked in country was Lassa fever. That was about three years ago, somewhere in Ashanti region and in Eastern region. And here he quick, picked it early and uh, contained it. So our preparedness and response plan for other acute viral hemorrhagic fever quickly needed to be updated, which has been done. And um, we have working areas that there's a need for um, continuing surveillance, epidemiologic surveillance in the human population and the surveillance in the animal population. That is those areas. And this has been heightened and we are doing enhanced surveillance. And then the there are there designated places where people who suspect that they have Ebola or that others have Ebola can go? Here, we, the designated places, the minist Ministry of Health, the Ghana Health Service Director General has directed that all regions should 
at least have one designated the regional hospitals have an area for isolation where initially when you pick a case that is where you can treat and um uh, in, start the investigation till finally if you confirm well as much as possible if you should see a case other confirmed or suspected and the capacity is in the facility to manage it will be good that you don't transfer because all the transfer process mm -hmm. can contaminate one the environment and then can also lead to further spread so that's that is one two so back to the question designated place the regions in fact we have had as a country this is the 15th suspected case that we are investigating and the regions appear to be well prepared and here in the national level Accra the areas that we have designated one third seven military hospital mm -hmm. but the preparation for isolation to be honest is not optimal and you need to take steps indeed now all everybody is up and well this last case test case that we need to double up our we have we, are, we have double you are doubling our steps to finalize those uh, isolation areas at 37 at kolibu and then we have to think beyond that if you have mass casualty situation what do you do guinea now they have the ebola treatment center in the form of tents somewhere in the city and with support they are managing the cases there so where we have identified now and steps have uh, I, 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 we've started taking steps to get the temporary shelter and the, uh, the trade fair area that's pavilions there which are not being used you know likely in, no no likely in the unfortunate event because the likelihood is there the unfortunate event of we having mass casualty situation mm -hmm. we've discussed with the other agencies who should provide the support so that that would be one of the areas that we would manage cases i say it's not um health alone because immediately we need tents rooms if i read of the national disaster management organization they are experts in quickly organizing those things and they we have some tents to enable us raise tent homes mm. to manage the cases well, so, what are the implications for traveling within the sub-region especially from areas where the disease has been identified guinea for example Traveling to and from that area yeah. is a risk factor. It's a, it's a big risk. So what are we doing about it? What we are doing is at our points of entry, people coming from that area, we have to keep, we have to keep eyes on them. Do we have the capacity? Well, it, 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 we, is there a flight, a ship is coming, a, um, a ship, I mean, a vessel is coming to the country and uh, the... The, the, there is clear indication that this, this person is, has been to Guinea, especially direct flight. Then the port health staff um, are those that have been trained to be at the various points of entry and work with the immigration staff to use simple checklists, ask about symptoms, and if present, they would take steps to um start the necessary investigation but then here if the person is incubating then it's very difficult because uh for the system to pick it there should be symptoms and it will be also be very difficult back to you say why don't you test anybody that is crossing our ground if the person is coming if the person is coming from one of these infected Even areas. the problem of house numbers no, numbers is house numbers street names and oh so that on. one it's, it's, a a, it's a problem here in ghana yes. mm -hmm. indeed recently a team a Ghanaian team were from uh, were deported from guinea and they came to ghana eight of them immediately we met them at the airport screened them using the symptoms took their contact address and then followed them 
to their homes, handed them over to the districts where they are going to reside, and then made the districts follow them for the incubation period, maximum 21 days. Lucky none of them became um, diseased. But there were only eight. It. If, if, if there were 500, how then, then that, that would be very... These are the issues that... So, at times, it's easy when it's um, handy numbers. But the, the, you can have a very nice proposal and um, theories. But then, things that can be overwhelming are things like numbers that you are talking about. So Recently we had one suspected case. The American who was at the Nyaho clinic. Yeah, yes. How are we sure? Are we absolutely certain that is not a case of Ebola? Now, I'm very definite and to me, I'm very convinced that it's not a case of Ebola. One, um, the person presented, um, I think he reported to the hospital, the main features were the bleeding tendencies. Fever was not very cardinal, no, very, very visible. But then that did not mask our suspicion because this is an old man, 62 years uh, he had other conditions like the, the diabetic condition and these things suppress fever. So if the fever is not there, it doesn't mean that it couldn't have been mm -hmm. having. So that one with the bleeding tendencies that he reported, initially I must uh, commend the staff at uh, Nyaho and they did very well with the high index of suspicion and I've read a lot on the condition. So the bleeding tendency, so they went back and asked about the travel history. If that shouldn't have it, had not come in, even we didn't have suspected Ebola because causes of vomiting blood are many. Mm -hmm. So it's not everybody who vomits blood, you say Ebola. If you vomit blood, you have fever, you suspect Ebola. This one, vomiting blood, no Ebola. Then the doctors, the medical team, inquired into travel history and um, he had been in Guinea for about three weeks, came to Ghana on the 10th of June or so and then uh, about a month, almost a month later uh, he started vomiting blood and he rushed to the hospital and the so when quickly it was one Sunday morning not started in Saturday, Sunday we had the information that this man has been investigated for with bloody um, vomitors and then passing bloody stools and the travel history of having gone to um, Guinea so quickly uh, that same day weekend but we still had to make steps take steps to reach them so let's investigate and find out what he's doing we called on team pick the blood sample protection supported the facility with uh, protective equipment and then the personal protective equipment to manage the cases the case and then uh, a range of the our the, um, reference laboratories, the Gucci Memorial Institute Medical Research, mm -hmm. and um, they came stand stand by that if you bring the sample, they are there to start the investigation. And as soon as the sample was there, they started the investigation, and they have come out clearly that the test was initially they tested for Ebola, which was the test is negative for Ebola. We had that feedback. Um, this is yesterday or two days ago, mm -hmm. and then just before a few early sometime early today, they came out clearly that in Federans they have tested for other causes, other um, pathogen, other um, viruses that can cause uh, bloody vomiting and mm -hmm. uh, bleeding tendencies, and uh, that in other ways that can ca cause acute viral hemorrhagic fevers. And they have tested for Marburg, Dengue, Lassa fever, West Nile fever, Yellow fever, and all these are negative. So now that we are clear of the absence of pathogen, contagion, infectious, deadly infectious materials, I think we can proceed with other tests to... Uh, identify the other possible, you, and then now we can investigate into other possible causes. But initially, when the, those things had not been ruled out, 
doing invasive investigation is a major risk that's contaminating the environment, con contaminating the personnel. So now you can proceed to further test. So you know, you know far better than I do. But as a lay person, right. you know, there are times when you have malaria and the tests are done and no parasite can be found in the bloodstream. Right. And the doctors say that it's in the spleen. Could it just not be possible that the test we have now may not be able to detect the virus at all times? The test that we do here at Noguchi is a PCR, which is a molecular test. Mm -hmm. And that is highly sensitive, it's highly specific. And that is being done by well-trained, committed professional staff that show a lot of professionalism who are particular about um, quality issues and then they have good track record and are meticulous in their work. So now Ebola, the molecular test is the test that you use to say that this is your father or this is not your father. It's the same PCR. If this test can go this far, so that's very difficult for this test to fail us. So but then you can, can double this. What, what so the likelihood that, of this test that failing is, is, is the best we have. Is the best we have for now. But could the best still not be short of the optimum? Early in the onset, if that's the initial stage when the infect, if the, 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 there's not much uh, infection and the viral load is low, Possibly, but then if to the extent of bleeding and, and the bleeding is due to Ebola, it will show. Okay. Doctor, thank you very much for you coming. Uh, it's been so. a pleasure talking to you.